as we've shared over the last few weeks, efforts to stay home, physically distance, and more have slowed the spread of COVID-19 and saved hundreds of lives. Once again, Vermonters have shown a willingness to sacrifice for the greater good and to step up to help their neighbors. I thank you for your commitment and your ongoing vigilance, which will help keep us, uh, this, uh, keep us uh, with this virus at bay and methodically restart our economy. But I know this has been a significant sacrifice for far too many families who have struggled with unemployment and businesses and entrepreneurs across the state who have seen their world and dreams evaporate right before their eyes through no fault of their own. I know there are too many small business owners who are desperate right now. Family businesses that have been around for decades who don't see a path out of the red. New entrepreneurs who just months ago had so much hope and now face a whole new reality. The corner cafes, restaurants, and distilleries, once thriving, now can't pay their rent. Employers who care deeply about their employees facing gut-wrenching decisions on who gets their hours reduced and who is laid off. I know you're all scared, sad, and probably pretty angry. I get it. I helped grow a business for over 30 years, so I know how devastating it would be to face these challenges and not know what to do to fix it. And the fact is, these businesses and their employees from hard hit sectors like tourism and hospitality drive our economy, put food on the tables of Vermonters, pay taxes which fund important social services, and let's not forget all the charitable contributions they make to help their communities. That's why those beside me and along with many private partners in the legislature have been working to put a plan together to help employers and small business owners across the state so we can keep jobs open, costs down, and move towards economic recovery. I'll ask my team to share the details, but this is a $400 million package funded through the Federal CARES Act in two separate phases. The first is a $310 million immediate relief initiative to get money out the door to help businesses survive right now. Many are still closed. Others have reduced operations and are just barely holding on. And this package will help them keep afloat while we get through this phase. It includes grants and loans for those most impacted, funds to help stabilize rental housing and help renters, technical assistance for business owners trying to work their way through this crisis, an in-state focused marketing campaign to jumpstart local buying and exploring our state. Phase two, which we'll present more fully in the coming weeks, will be a $90 million investment to help our economy not just survive, but come out better positioned to thrive well into the future. My team will share more details next, but first I want to send my appreciation to our congressional delegation, Senator Leahy, Senator Sanders, and Congressman Welch, for their work to secure CARES Act funding for Vermont. Without them and the efforts of their talented staff, we wouldn't be able to do any of this today. And I look forward to working with the legislature to move these initiatives forward. They have been committed throughout this pandemic to move quickly to help Vermonters. And together, we can make a real difference. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Secretary Curley for no more details on our approach. Secretary Curley. Thank you, Governor. As we all know, the economic hit our state has taken to contain and control the spread of this virus has been devastating to thousands of Vermonters and their businesses. But Vermont held strong and remained united, adhering to the executive orders and the guidance and ultimately slowing the spread. We believe the economic relief and recovery package we are proposing today is our first punch back at this virus. The storm is not over, but this is our first collective step towards repairing economic bridges 
and ensuring the survival of our business community. We know this recovery will be long and that steps announced today will not solve every problem we face, but it represents the beginning of our journey down the road to recovery and survival and positions us to move forward in building an innovative economy that will thrive in the years ahead. As the governor said, we are looking at four categories using these federal CARES Act dollars to aid businesses in economic recovery. Financial, technical, and housing assistance paired with marketing and consumer spending assistance. Over the last two months, our team has engaged with hundreds of businesses and community leaders. We've collected business impact data from thousands of businesses and consulted with many associations, trade groups, legislators, and others as we've worked towards these solutions that we are presenting today. This economic recovery package has truly been a community effort. I want to thank all those who have advised us along the way, including the Economic Mitigation Recovery Task Force, as well as the thousands of Vermonters who have emailed, called, and engaged us since this virus came to our front door. The largest portion of this $400 million relief and recovery package is $250 million of financial assistance in the form of direct grants and loans to Vermont businesses. These initiatives are intended to protect people now and help them find a path back to profitable operation. We're proposing, right off the top, $150 million will be used to provide Restart Vermont action grants to those hardest hit sectors of food and accommodation services, retail, and agriculture to be used for fixed cost expenses like rent, mortgage payments, utilities, inventory, or other essential operating expenses. These grants will not need to be repaid and will be dispersed by the Department of Taxes based on tax revenues. The Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets will be dispersing grants as well. In addition, $80 million will be used to create what we are calling the Vermont Economic Injury and Disaster Grants and low and no interest loans with extended amortizations that will be available to businesses in other sectors. Those grants and loans will be dispersed by the Vermont Economic Development Authority. We have 20 million in Restart Vermont loans and grants for the heartbeat of our economy. Our small businesses and nonprofits with less than 1 million in revenue and five or fewer employees. The state's nonprofit leaders will administer and disperse these funds. With this influx of resources, we want to ensure and we want to provide businesses with the necessary tools to navigate them properly. Creating a technical assistance network will aid in financial planning for grant and loan applications and other business support structures. This navigator network will also provide tools to help employers reimagine and reconfigure their businesses to adjust and thrive in this new economy. This network will also provide immediate access to employee well-being resources to ensure Vermonters and their families are supported as they return to work. As I said, there is still a lot ahead of us as we push back on what this virus has done to our economy. We believe this plan will provide immediate relief and bring our local communities and businesses closer together as we all work towards a thriving economic future. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Tebitz to talk more about the agriculture relief portion of this financial assistance package, followed by the Agency of Com uh, Commerce and Community Development Commissioners, who will talk about other aspects of the plan, as well as two task force members for their perspective on how this plan fits into the Vermont economic landscape. Secretary Tebbets. Thank you, uh, Secretary Curley and, and Governor Scott, and thank you for, for Vermonters uh, for uh, sticking in there. 
Uh, this is a story about survival. Dairy farmers and those who make cheese, butter, yogurt, and ice cream, and milk face an uncertain future. The collapse of markets, particularly overnight, has forced farmers, cheesemakers, and others into profound losses. The financial impact has already hit farm families, and the forecast is dismal for June, July, and August, with an estimated milk prices hitting historic lows. It could well extend into the fall. Some of the facts. Vermont cheesemakers have reported sales losses ranging from 50 to 95 percent. Their markets have dried up practically overnight in New York, in Boston, Washington, and those spots where Vermont cheese was on the menu. From the farm, it's protected that, pro projected that small farms in Vermont will lose approximately $58,000 in annual income due to the milk price declines. A medium farm, $117,000 in annual income loss. And large farms could see $1.16 million in losses in income. It's projected that many dairy farms will not be able to pay their bills next month and five dairy farmers and farms closed the first weekend of May, and many more could be next if we do not act. As our state slowly and safely reopens the economy and considers welcoming visitors to Vermont, we want to ensure our dairy farmers and our agriculture community will be here to continue providing for Vermonters and others. We want visitors to see Vermont's hills, the valleys, the open spaces, and enjoy dairy on the menu. Dairy needs immediate term stimulus grants to maintain farms and continued food production. These grants would allow businesses to cover expenses incurred during this time when their income is low due to a health crisis that is well beyond their control. Farms have also lost production, staff, and markets. At risk are many businesses who also rely on dairy for a paycheck. Those are the feed and seed dealers, the veterinarians, and those who sell to and supply our farmers. Also in jeopardy, the hundreds of jobs who make world-class dairy products. Under the proposal, dairy farmers and dairy processors could receive payments. The total package is $50 million. $40 million would be allocated to dairy farmers. The remaining $10 million would be allocated to dairy processors, including those who make cheese, butter, yogurt, ice cream, and milk who have sustained losses under COVID-19. Like our friends who own restaurants, and inns, and hotels, and small businesses in our small towns and villages, these grants would provide relief and hope that pushes Vermont towards recovery. This is about survival and setting up farmers for success. Now is our time to support the backbone of Vermont so it can heal and create a path that protects those who make their living off the land. I'd like to turn it over to uh, the Commissioner of Housing, Commissioner Hanford, and he'll outline some of the priorities when it comes to our housing program. Commissioner. Thank you, Secretary. We know there's pain and uncertainty out there. Families have seen a loss or reduction of income and are unable or struggling to pay rent. As a result, landlords across the state are not receiving full rental payments necessary to pay their own bills and maintain their buildings. If we don't act, there could be immediate harm to Vermont households and long-term harm to the health and availability of rental housing. By providing $42 million and direct financial assistance to landlords and tenants, we can stabilize the rental housing industry and prevent tenants from experiencing eviction and possibly homelessness. This program will provide up to three months of emergency rental assistance and rental arrearage payments to property owners whose tenants are struggling to make rental payments. We can eliminate rental arrearages or past due rent and ensure tenants maintain their current housing. Payments will be limited to a maximum of 20 rental units per property owner and will be awarded based on documented need. At proposed funding levels, it's anticipated this program can assist more than 13,000 Vermont households. 
helping them cover the rent payments and addressing more than 15% of the state's rental housing stock. Payments will be dispersed through housing service providers through a process developed by the Department of Housing and Community Development. A second part of our recovery plan is uh, to help those that are experiencing homelessness. As you may know, service providers throughout Vermont have done an incredible job protecting homeless families and individuals from this pandemic. In fact, we are leaders in the nation and to continue protecting this vulnerable population and maintain public health, returning to the old norm is not an option. Additional housing will be needed quickly to help our neighbors and community members currently sheltering in motels and temporary housing. At the same time, many communities throughout Vermont have existing homes and rental properties that remain vacant and in substandard state. This is often due to lack of resources to bring units up to rental housing safety codes. A recent housing study reported that Vermont has roughly 19,000 units of substandard poor quality homes in need of reinvestment. By providing emergency $8 million in emergency housing rehabilitation grants and forgivable loans through this program, we can make up to 250 units of housing available to rehouse families and individuals experiencing homelessness during this crisis. We know these are challenging times, but we think we have a plan to really address the situation. And thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Commissioner Pelham. Thank you, Governor. Over the last few weeks, we have seen the slow reopening of our local businesses. It was great to see some of our retailers open again on Monday, and now with campgrounds and lodging establishments opening on Friday, we are on the road to recovery. But with the amount of disruption that we have seen in the tourism and hospitality sector, we know it will still be a struggle for many businesses even after they reopen their doors. Our inns and many of our restaurants and independent retailers rely on revenue from out-of-state guests, especially in the summer, which is our busiest tourism season. The marketing portion of this economic recovery package, $5 million, recognizes that it may be some time before we can fully welcome out-of-state residents back to Vermont. In the meantime, we see a real opportunity for Vermonters to take full advantage of some of the same amenities that our visitors come here to enjoy, which will directly support our communities and small businesses. With an investment in a promotional marketing campaign, we will encourage Vermonters to rediscover our downtown and all the food, recreation, and cultural experiences you can find in our great state. By promoting local consumer spending throughout Vermont, we can provide an immediate boost to our restaurants, retailers, and tourism properties as they reopen. The early support that Vermonters can offer to our local businesses is the first step to economic stability. We are all due for a little R&R &R as we start restart Vermont, and we hope to do that with respect to those around us while rediscovering all there is in our own backyard. With this statewide campaign, the Department of Tourism and Marketing will create a marketing toolkit of creative assets for communities, organizations, and individual, pro individual properties to use to encourage travel and recreation within Vermont. We're recognizing the uniqueness of our regions and the power of consumer spending. The bulk of the marketing funds in this economic recovery package will be used for regional marketing and consumer stimulus grants. This grant funding will be available for regional organizations to create consumer stimulus programs that encourage local spending. We know that communities have their own ideas about what might work best for their region. So this grant funding would be flexible to be used for programs like buy local challenges or loyalty affinity or gift card programs or incentive payments to local businesses to create discounted opportunities or packages at inns, stores and restaurants, for example, for Vermonters to be able to take advantage of. By investing in our local communities, and encouraging Vermonters to explore the state and spend locally, we can jumpstart economic activity and support our small businesses as they recover. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. 
Now I'd like to introduce Commissioner Goldstein. Hello, thank you, Governor. And thank you to fellow secretaries and commissioners for going through the detail and introducing the details around phase one, what we need to survive. We are spending a lot of time in the last couple of weeks and in the next few weeks to get this approved and active. But we really need to emerge from this crisis better than before. How do we thrive post COVID? And it is vital that we pay attention and allocate the proper resources to ensure that we do just that in what we call the thrive portion. So a bit of a glimpse into what we think that will be. We are already working on some of the details. We don't have it ready just yet, but we would expect that the remainder of the 400 uh, million that is not taken up by the phase one would be for phase two. We know that phase one may not be enough as businesses adjust to this new reality of reduced capacity in some cases. We want to create a loan guarantee program to bring the full distribution network of the financial system of Vermont, the banks and the credit unions into the state to continue to add liquidity to the economy, but with a guarantee that will backstop those loans. We first wanna see how this will, first phase will unfold and how the federal programs will turn out. We also know that there needs to be seed or capital funding. We want to emerge from this stronger. What does that mean? It means we need to diversify and not be dependent on any one uh, sector. And we need to, um, you know, people call it seed capital. It could be pivot capital. How do we help further new technologies, inventions, intellectual capital to bring about uh, employers and knowledge workers to the state and, and have them grow? We also know we're going to need some broadband investment, and we know that there is a sweeping broadband plan, but we also know that there are things we could do in the coming months before the end of calendar 2020 to ensure that all children and students can learn from home and people can work remotely and patients can utilize telehealth in the event that the pandemic continues um, for an indefinite period of time. We know that our communities may look different. Perhaps there are streets that we close to traffic so restaurants can expand outdoor seating and perhaps better utilization and repurposing of vacant lots so that we could have more retail sales. But, you know, these are the things that we're working on. Last but not least will be an effort afoot to uh, retrain folks, right? There may be unemployment that lasts a bit longer than we expected. How do we retrain some of the folks uh, to get the proper certifications and degrees for the positions that are most in need. Um, and actually, I said last but not least, but we also want to work on permitting. And what we mean by that is to have a project development force to accelerate or jumpstart construction and investment in public and private capital projects that may have been uh, detained or, or delayed by the COVID, by the COVID crisis. If there was ever a time to make these investments, it is now. We are facing extraordinary challenges. And so we need extraordinary measures to rebuild and reimagine Vermont. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Joan. Uh, now I'd like to introduce fellow Bear, Barry Native, uh, former mayor, uh, CPA and entrepreneur, uh, Tom Lozon. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning. I'm Tom Lozon. I'm a CPA and principal in the firm of Salvador and Babic PC in Barrie. I serve on the uh, Financial and Technical Support Subcommittee of the Governor's Economic Mitigation and Recovery Task Force. You know, I'd like to start uh, by thanking the thousands of small business owners who have reached out and responded to our team on some level. You know, for so many of them, uh, we know this is by far the worst financial event their business has ever experienced. They've shown incredible grace and determination while under enormous financial pressure, and their attitude really inspires us. Uh, for those small businesses who haven't heard their sector specifically mentioned today, let me assure you that we see you, we hear you, and you are included on, in these assistance programs. Uh, we know that virtually every business, from the media covering this event to the tent rental companies supporting outdoor events, and virtually every business in between, has been affected on some level. Obviously, some are more affected 
and will continue to be uh, more affected than others. Our challenge is to provide the right level of technical and financial assistance to all affected businesses and to preserve the economic infrastructure that is the very backbone of Vermont's cities and towns. I want to thank Congress and the SBA and our small business lenders for the quick passage and rollout of the Payroll Protection Loan Program. In only 13 days here in Vermont, we deployed over $1 billion in support to our small businesses. I can tell you, as a preparer of many, many PPP applications on behalf of clients, our local lenders were working 12 hours a day, seven days a week in those early days. But as much as we appreciate and value the support and relief at the federal level, we quickly realized that the PPP program, as designed, would be of little use to a closed business or a business running at below 50% capacity because of the 10-day disbursement and eight-week expenditure window, the PPP program provides uh, little, medium, and long-term benefit to businesses in this category. So I want to stress two things. Uh, I am very grateful for the program. I never mean to sound critical. But with that said, we need, and I am hopeful, based on my look at the current House and Senate proposals, for sweeping and significant PPP reform. Uh, the need for PPP reform, I believe, is best demonstrated by the fact that lending under PPP2 has slowed significantly. P1 was exhausted in about 13 days. We're 24 days into P2, and we still have significant lending capacity. Because we, we now better understand the program deficiencies, I believe many small businesses, unfortunately, appear to be sitting round two out, even though they desperately need financial assistance. But even with PPP reform, we recognize that the benefit of this program would not extend far enough, both in terms of time frame and eligibility, to preserve our economic infrastructure. Reacting to that, and with the input of many small businesses and associations, we outlined a plan that provides for immediate infusion of grant capital to small businesses for expenses and costs lying outside the PPP allowances. For those with borrowing capacity, and with needs such as inventory that will increase even greater when they get fully open, we provided direct loans and guarantees with more generous repayment terms. We provided uh, the technical assistance that is not provided in any existing federal programs and is absolutely essential to small businesses. We provided support to landlords and tenants who are not PPP eligible and who are in danger of default or homelessness. In short, where we saw a program or funding gap, we tried our best to fill it. So in closing, I, I just want to thank the governor and his extraordinary team, uh, the Vermont House and Senate leadership, all of them, for their receptiveness to our ideas and, and for their anticipated quick reaction. We believe these initial proposals are grounded in both need and reality. We know that today is only the beginning of what will be a long period of recovery for our small businesses and organizations in Vermont. In the coming weeks and months, we remain committed to supporting them, not only with these programs, but with other programs and ideas as needs arise. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Mary McClure. Mary is the CEO of Green Mountain Power, and she also chairs our subcommittee. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Governor. And uh, thanks to the entire team at ACCD uh, and all of our teammates uh, who are a part of the task force uh, and the action, uh, action team work we've been uh, undergoing. Um, as Tom said, my name is Mary McClure and I'm the president of Green Mountain Power. Uh, I've been working alongside Tom and our other teammates on the uh, action team and I share all his passion uh, and his concern uh, for all of Vermont businesses. It has no doubt been devastating to hear and see the impact this virus has had on our economy and our beloved Vermont small businesses and industries. Uh, Today's announcement is really great news uh, for businesses and for our immediate economic recovery here in the state. Uh, in addition to the, all the folks you've heard from today, there are dozens and dozens of stakeholders, business leaders, and other Vermonters who have given a lot of time to help inform and shape the work of our action teams and specifically uh, of this plan. 
you already heard the details of phase one, but I wanted to call attention in particular to the important investments in technical support for businesses throughout the state. Uh, we have heard from, uh, in our conversations over the past several weeks with hundreds of business owners that many small businesses need help, not only direct, uh, but also help navigating the programs, grants, loans, uh, and other opportunities available because as we know, as Tom just described with the uh, federal PPP program, they often come with guidelines, restrictions, and other requirements that can be very difficult to weed through. And we know many of the small businesses we've worked with do not have finance departments, legal departments, staff accountants to help them navigate and they need support and guidance from a trusted source. Uh, and that's where this technical assistance line will help. It'll be a bridge to that information and expert advice will be coming from fellow Vermonters. Uh, this is ultimately about ensuring Vermont businesses have the support they need to make the right decisions for their recovery. Uh, in addition to uh, our immediate and near-term work, uh, we are also uh, looking out into the future and into the longer term recovery with later phases of this work that will help uh, recover stronger than before. We can help make a much more resilient uh, Vermont economy. Uh, there is already work on what those next phases will look like, uh, including initiatives like the access to uh, statewide broadband as Commissioner Goldstein referenced earlier. Uh, we know this is a foundational issue for economic and educational opportunity, as well as programs like telehealth, uh, particularly in rural communities across the state. So our action team is pleased to roll up our sleeves and be a part of this recovery. So thank you again, Governor, and the entire team at ACCD, and really across uh, all of state leadership and all you're doing to help our uh, state recover strong. We are Vermont United, thank you. Well, thank you, Mary, and uh, thank you not only for your uh, service on Restart uh, on the committee, uh, but also for lending us so many employees during our time of need from the, in the call center at the Labor Department. So thank you again for that. Uh, with that, we'll now open up to questions. All right, we'll start with Calvin. All right, thank you. So when we talk about the support that's available for small businesses, um, what about businesses that have already had to shut their doors permanently and they, they're out of business and they close? Thank you, Curly. Um, thank you, Calvin, for the question. You know, this is really difficult. You know, it is not our goal to box anyone out from these opportunities. So if, if businesses have closed, maybe they could still consider it temporary if they um, knew that they were able to get this relief, if they could um, be confident that that um, influx, that grant money to help them cover those expenses while they were closed down um, could help bring them back, then I would encourage them to look into that and to consider that. Um, maybe more of a question for Secretary Pettit Suha. So a lot of uh, the grant money is going towards dairy farms, but what about non-dairy farms like vegetables or beef farms? That's what Yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, the immediate need right now is we're, we're able to find uh, uh, the losses and calculate the losses really uh, quickly under dairy. Um, it's, it's, it, the, the paycheck has already come from the last month uh, and catastrophic losses have already been incurred there. Uh, there may be losses outside of agriculture. Some of these other programs uh, that Secretary Curley uh, has outlined some of those businesses may qualify uh, for some of these uh, grants as well because they are businesses and a farm is a business, a dairy farm is a business. So they may qualify for some of the uh, funding of there. I would encourage everyone uh, to really uh, push the pencil, look at these programs. Um, if, you're, if you're a CSA, if you're, if you're a farmer's market and a vendor there, I would encourage everyone to be focused on the entire package, not necessarily on the dairy package. And just to recall, maybe for Governor Scott, um, can some of this money be used for child care centers as well as at the small business? Or yes, the some of the nonprofits, child care uh, facilities as well. Uh, yes. Stewart? Uh, $310 million 
million dollars sounds like a lot, but I don't have the context to know whether that's sufficient. And I'm wondering if you could, what is your timeline for, you know, how far into the future this, this money will be helpful? Um, is this just to get through the year? There was a remark about, uh, you know, it could be a long time before we allow visitors here again. And I'm just wondering uh, how, uh, what the time frame is. Yeah. You think? This is really to stabilize uh, the economy at this point in time. Uh, it is, um, we understand that this is not enough. Uh, and I would anticipate that we need more in the future. Uh, that's why we have the second phase as well. Um, but this is really just to stabilize those who are in dire straits right now uh, to make sure that they uh, can exist as we work our way out of this. And we do open up the economy and we have more visitors to the state uh, because we hope in the not too distant future that will become a reality. Secretary Curley, anything else? When you said the not too distant future, so this is just spring, early summer. Uh, really. This is this is really uh, what they've uh, endured at this point <clears throat> in this uh, time period, the first uh, three or four months, and then we'll look outside of that as well. What do we need to do to recover? Because no, none of us have a crystal ball, although our numbers are, are, are good. Uh, we see some hope. We see some light at the end of the tunnel, and uh, we hope to get people back in, in, in business, and we hope to be able to have more people coming into the state. As we look around the region, we'll have some modeling on, on Friday. Uh, to show that the other states are showing some uh, some signs of hope as well. And when that happens, uh, we'll be able to, again, welcome them back into Vermont, which we know is necessary uh, for some of our hospitality that, that we have. How, if I'm a small business, how quickly can I get a check? That would be Secretary Crowley. <laughs> Secretary Crowley, you're going to have to answer that question. Sir, you know, it's our hope to get the money in the hands of these small businesses as soon as possible. Um, as the governor has mentioned, the legislature and the governor have agreed to work together on this. So we have spent the last few days uh, working through the details and sharing the details with the legislators and taking feedback as well. And they understand how critical it is to help get something passed quickly. Um, once it's passed, we hope that we can turn this around um, in less than a month. But um, again, I'd rather under, under promise and over deliver on that one. Uh, Governor, this is along the lines of uh, economic health, but also openings. Um, the healthcare system, uh, the hospitals out there, uh, they're, they're, they're hurting financially as well. And I've been getting a lot of questions about when they were going to be able to be opened up uh, for um, elective things, uh, you know, regular regular checkups, uh, stuff that can bring the, uh, the money in. And on the other side, uh, more on the tourism side, but a lot of towns are trying to uh, make their plans for the July 4th weekend and we're a month and change out. So. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, well, I'm gonna ask uh, S Secretary Smith uh, to answer the part about the hospitals and opening them back, back up. Uh, we've done a lot of that, uh, taking um, the elective surgeries, allowing that to happen. And I know this is uh, not instantaneous, uh, but uh, but that's our hope that, that we'll be able to, to get them back on the, the path to recovery as well. Um, I would also add uh, that uh, we know uh, that we have to make sure our healthcare system is protected. Uh, that's why when we look at the entire fund, the $1.25 billion, uh, when you take you know 300 million of that for the emergency itself, uh, then you take this $400 million for the economy. Uh, you might take another $300 million uh, for the health care system. It doesn't leave a lot of money uh, in terms of all the other needs we have, whether it's be the state college system, uh, the public uh, school system, and other needs uh, that we've identified. It just doesn't go far enough, nor does it give us the latitude to do a number of those initiatives. So, again, we look for uh, some more help uh, from the federal government. I know the congressional delegation is working on this. And uh, we'll just have to see. But we have to, again, deal with reality, uh, play the cards we're dealt, and we'll do the best we can with what we have. Secretary Smith. Thank you, Governor. Um, that's a really good question, and the Governor was absolutely right. We, we realize um, the financial pressure that the health care industry system is under right now 
and we expect to see you'll see a future announcement um, similar to I think what you're seeing here uh, on this but let me get specifically to your question when will we see the healthcare system sort of open up I think if you stay tuned on Friday, you will see the majority of, of the healthcare system being opened up on Friday. We'll go through specifically what is being opened up, the time frames for those various uh, openings as well. Um, and we're looking across a broad spectrum of uh, professions within the healthcare industry, from acupuncturists to dental to all of that in terms of when they can expect to open up and the time frame along that that line. Uh, just about the 4th of July, the towns being able to plan everything. Yeah, you know, very difficult to, to determine what's going to happen around the 4th of July period. Um, obviously, we're going week to week on this, and uh, it really will depend on the numbers and, uh, and the data and the science that we've uh, been watching, the modeling, and so forth. But. Um, I would I would have to say uh, that we will not be back to a normal Fourth of July weekend. All right, we'll move to the phones now. Just uh, I think you all know who's on the line, but wanted to also make sure you knew that Dr. Levine uh, was in the room, even though he didn't have any remarks today. Uh, we'll start with Kat at WCAX. Hi, I'd like to hear more about this plan to address homelessness and how it's going to work. So have we identified these 250 units that we're going to spend the $8 million on around the state? And where are they? Um, how will the state choose who lives in them? Because we know that there are far more than 250 people being housed in hotels and motels right now. Will there be plans to find people jobs in those communities? How are we going to sustain this long term? I think there's a lot of details here that um, have not been addressed. Yeah, there, there are a lot of details. I'll ask uh, Commissioner Hanford if uh, he might be able to comment on, on part of some of those questions. Sure, um, there are a lot of details to work out. And, and this is, is not an attempt to solve the entire uh, challenge with the number of families that are in hotels and motels around the state. But we have to start somewhere. This is a, a, a good plan to use existing housing stock that needs reinvestment, give people a, a, a home to live in rather than a temporary situation. Um, the units themselves, um, th there's a, a good understanding of where they are. Um, but as soon as this is uh, passed and, and supported, we have uh, housing providers that will work on uh, getting this started quickly and try to match up services, rental assistance, support services from area homeless providers. Um, this has been done in the past in uh, limited fashion and, and certainly not on this time frame or, or at this scale. Uh, but it, but it, as I said, this is a uh, 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 attempt to address some of this problem immediately. Um, other solutions will be needed um, for the larger uh, term and long term uh, problem with, with uh, homeless households that are currently housed in motels right now. Maybe Secretary Smith um, might want to uh, address some of the, the rest of that question. Secretary Smith. Thanks, Kat, uh, for the question. We are in the development of, a, of programs right now to try to figure out, um, to sort of unwind what we did uh, during the, the height of the pandemic. And just, just to remind people, we housed everyone uh, that was homeless into the, during this uh, pandemic. We did it through the motel hotel voucher system, but that's unsustainable for the long term. So right now we're looking at what funding we can have that's available, uh, both federal, uh, mostly federal along the way, and what can be sustainable uh, in terms of funding, and how do we sort of unwind this in a very, very methodical way. There's a couple of plans that we've been working on. We aren't ready to share the details yet, uh, but you can rest assured that what we need to do is to get people into sustainable housing and out of these uh, motel uh, situations. And, and even before the pandemic, um, the motel hotel voucher system is not a solution. Uh, to a long-term pro problem. We don't provide services. There can be abuse uh, to that program. And, and lastly, 
I, I just think, you know, a, per, a more permanent housing solution or a more controlled housing solution or shelter solution is the is better than just putting people in motels, and that's what we're working on now. Any word on when those plans will be available? Well, we, we have to start unwinding this just to, for sustainability purposes. Uh, we have to start unwinding this uh, fairly soon. So I would, I would think you would see something uh, fairly uh, soon here. I can't put a time schedule on it right now. Thank you. And Kat, just to clarify uh, what Secretary Smith was just addressing was specific to the motel transition as far as the homelessness component of the plan uh, will be presenting legislation Tuesday? Oh, yes, Tuesday. Okay. Tuesday. Just want to differentiate between those two plans, if you're asking about timeline. <clears throat> All right, Ann Wallace-Allen, VT Digger. Hi, I, I think this is a question for um, Secretary Goldstein. Um, could you please tell me more about this broadband plan? I'm wondering how much money is involved and what it's going to be used for and whether this will actually address the the last mile problem that has um, been an issue in Vermont for many years. So the broadband I referred to is part of phase two. Um, so I don't have all of that detail worked out, but suffice to say that it would be <clears throat> those parts of the project that could be <clears throat> executed before calendar year of 2020. And so uh, more to come on that in the coming weeks. I, I would. Um, is there yeah, Sorry. I just want to uh, want to offer uh, that this is there are two separate packages. This is an initial package, uh, but we're working on a much larger package uh, in anticipation of more of an REA uh, type of approach from the federal government, and this is going to involve federal money. So uh, we are engaging with our federal delegation at this point in time. We're preparing uh, for that uh, in anticipation uh, that there may be some significant funding available in the future for broadband. So this, this package does not solve the last mile. Uh, and, uh, and again, we're looking at a much larger package uh, to deliver if, uh, if funds become available through the federal government. Do you mind if I um, ask a follow-up sure. to that? Um, so you guys are getting, the state's getting $1.25 billion, right, from the CARES Act yes. total? Um, so, uh, and you're talking today. You're talking about the 400 billion. So, will this broadband package that comes on later will that be using, um, you know, the rest of the CARES money or the other part that hasn't been spent yet, or no. is it going to be different money from the feds? It'll be separate money, uh, different money from the feds. Uh, as I laid out um, in the one of the previous questions, when you take a look at the 1.25 billion, which sounds like a lot of money, and it is, and we're very appreciative for it. Uh, when you take the $300 million that we're spending on the emergency itself uh, through this CARES money, uh, the $400 million for the economic package we laid out today, uh, the relief there and relief for businesses and renters and so forth, uh, and then you take uh, the health care system that we need to protect and make sure that we have, uh, that, that they have all they need uh, to uh, preserve uh, that system. That's going to be maybe another $300 million. Uh, that's a billion dollars right there. So it doesn't leave a lot of extra money uh, when you consider all the other initiatives that are out there, the, the state colleges uh, and uh, the public school system uh, and some of the other, maybe the hazard pay initiative and so forth. So there are a lot of other unmet needs. Uh, this is not near enough uh, to meet every single sector. Um, so we're doing the best we can uh, with what we have uh, in anticipation again with this broadband initiative. Uh, um, and the Public Service uh, Department, uh, uh, Commissioner Tierney, is working on this uh, directly, and we'll um, we'll be again working with our federal dele delegation in anticipation of a much larger package uh, that would really uh, be more widespread throughout Vermont. Thank you very much, Lisa. The AP. Hi, Lisa. Um, Hi, I have a question about testing, and since Dr. Levine is not on the call, I'm hoping someone else might be able to answer. Yeah, Do Dr. Um, Levine is actually here in the room. He'll be able to answer that oh, okay. question. Okay, so so I was told that as of May 16th, um, the total tests reported in the state data no longer includes 
the serology or antibody tests that were recorded by some lab. Um, and it now only reflects people who were tested for a current COVID infection. And I'm wondering why, why was the, uh, why were the serology tests included to begin with? And when did that data start getting added? Yes, thanks for that question and the opportunity to explain that. Because um, we actually, when we discovered this, wondered ourselves, why were the serology tests originally included? It turns out that when tests are done at various locations around the state, they're not all done by the state. They're done by a whole host of facilities, sent to a host of labs, and then results begin to come in. Um, because it's reportable disease, we end up getting the results in the end. So we learned that approximately 4% of the labs that were being reported in were the serology sort of labs. And as uh, said in previous conferences, serology or antibody testing labs basically look to see if a person has had an immune response to the virus. They don't say anything about being an active case of the virus. The standard we're using for that is the so-called PCR test, which is done of nasal and pharyngeal secretions. That test tells us pretty definitively what level of active disease there is in the state. So what we did on May 16th and this was in conforming with a number of other states actually as well, was to remove the serology tests from the denominator of total number of cases in the state. Practically speaking, when you look at our data, it hardly changes anything that you see. And if anything, it would have affected the number of uh, positive tests out of the total number of tests done and it would have made it look like we had an even lower positivity rate of all of our tests. Our positivity rate was already in the very low single digit numbers, and so the impact of removing the serology test at most would have been something in a fraction of a percent uh, positivity. Mm -hmm. So we really had very little impact on the data that people see from day to day. Um, and really didn't impact our, our policy or our future planning with regard to how we're dealing with the COVID pandemic because uh, it didn't make a huge difference. Uh, when did the state discover that those test results were included? Uh, I can't say the exact date. Uh, you know, we removed them on May 16th. I, I, I would say we probably knew about it at least a week or two before that time, if, if not longer, but didn't think that they were accounting for a very large amount of the uh, data. And then when we really started to drill down and say, are we accurately conveying to the rest of the world disease activity in the state, we said that probably isn't as accurate as it could be if these tests are included, so we should remove them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sean, the Chester Telegraph. Thank you. Um, we've heard um, from high school seniors and their parents uh, with some very creative ideas for in-person commencements, but most of them are outside the guidance the AOE has published for end-of-year events. What, what would the data have to look like for a socially distanced outdoor commencement to take place? Um, I will um, ask Secretary French if he could answer that, but I, I would add uh, that we have asked for creativity. Uh, so I uh, would, uh, would hope uh, that we would be considering uh, almost anything within the constraints of the maximum number of, of those gathering, uh, and we hope to increase that uh, by June 1st. So uh, Secretary French. Yes, thank you, Governor. Um, yes, we are uh, receiving a lot of creative requests. I would say the, the bulk of them do fall into uh, sort of the drive-in category. Um, and the guidance is, is pegged to the uh, limitations on the public group size, which, um, you know, we do expect to evolve. So, you know, we continue to work with districts and uh, we're anxious to, uh, 
support them in their creative solutions so that we can uh, make this uh, graduation season uh, one to remember. So um, districts should be in touch with the AOE to run their particular ideas by you? Yes, that's correct. They have. I've received about 20 requests, I think, today to review, and we're happy to do that. Thank you. Liz Hewitt, BT Digger. Can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, so we've heard a lot of concerns about the long lines at food drop-offs, and there's been an in in reporting food pantries seeing increased use. Um, but there's also been research by UVM that um, many people who are food insecure are not using three squares for mine. Um, how are you going to ensure that people with uh, dealing with food insecurity are aware of and are accessing available benefits um, and not going hungry? Yeah, this is a, a great concern to me. Obviously, what we saw last week at one of the uh, points uh, where they were um, had long lines at uh, some of the food centers. Um, and I've asked Secretary Smith uh, to take a look at the Meals on Wheels program uh, to see how much new activity is there, uh, as well as with the Vermont Food Bank, uh, so that we can do a, an assessment of, of the need. Uh, as well as what we can do in the future to provide for those in need uh, and to encourage those who uh, may be in need but uh, but haven't utilized the services to reach out to us uh, so that we can help. Um, Secretary Smith, can you add anything to that? Governor, you, uh, you did a great job in, in sort of outlining what is um, what we're doing, I, I think everyone was concerned on two two levels about um, what we saw at the Berlin Airport. Two is just the amount of people that that came, and two, were we really serving the people that were in need uh, in terms of food? So what we're doing internally is looking at how we distribute food in terms of making sure that those people that are in need, whether through Meals on Wheels, as the governor had talked about, or other mechanisms, that we actually pinpoint the people that are in need uh, as well. Now, that's not to say that people aren't in need that are going to these, uh, these various locations, but we want to make sure we're not missing anybody that from uh, a perspective that aren't getting to these um, to these drop-off centers. And secondly, um, I, I just want to make sure we're maximizing our effort here and using the existing um, structures that we have to reach out to people instead of having people come to us. So we're working on that right now. Just to follow up quickly, uh, hunger advocates have called on lawmakers to provide transportation funding so that meals can be bused to kids over the summer, um, which they say will increase that access to that. Do you support? Um, do you support that proposal, Governor? Yeah, we've been looking at that and uh, and hoping that we can utilize the same methods that we've done uh, thus far during this pandemic, uh, utilizing the school buses and so forth to deliver. Uh, lunches and meals uh, to those in need. So yes, uh, we'd like to take a look at that. Thank you. Right. Uh, moving to Mike Donahue at the Islander. Thank you very much. Uh, this is probably for the uh, honorable uh, former mayor of Barry. Uh, Tom, I'm wondering, uh, I believe you brought up help that was needed for the media, which has seen layoffs, furloughs, pay cuts, all due to substantial loss, advertising income from businesses that aren't operating. So I'm Looking a rookie, so I'm going to ask you to repeat your question. <laughs> so I guess I'm looking specifically at newspapers. How did your committee see exactly how this $400 million will help newspapers? specifically? Uh, well, first of all, not just newspapers, but uh, every business. Um, there really is no one size fits all. Some businesses experience a drop in revenue. Some businesses aren't experiencing a drop in revenue at all. They're actually seeing an increase in revenue 
but they're also seeing an increase in operating expenses, so which is sort of the same thing. Uh, so with whether it's a uh, you know a newspaper, uh, a grocery store, we wouldn't think of a grocery store as being challenged, but you know many of them are, and they're seeing shrinking margins because uh, certain. Uh, prices have gone up, their prices have gone up, and they're working hard to try to hold their prices in line and seeing shrinking margins. So uh, how a media, you know, media outlet or any business would be helped uh, would simply by applying for the program. So okay, like I said no, in the beginning, if you don't hear, if you don't hear your business sector being spoken about specifically, please don't assume that we've forgotten about you because we haven't. Okay, and one follow-up, uh, and I, maybe this is for Anson Debbitt. Uh, some farmer, farmers markets have opted not to open in 2020, and that leaves farmers, craft makers, bakers without an audience to sell products. What is the agency doing to for those businesses and any efforts to get some of the farmers markets to reconsider opening uh, so they can sell their wares? Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, it's our understanding a majority of the of the markets uh, are are going to open. We've we've had some open up in May, and we're going to have more. They're going to be opening up in um, June. Um, although there are some added expenses, uh, uh, some of the guidelines, um, sanitation is 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 an expense. Uh, spacing is an expense. Uh, some of the areas are challenged with uh, how much room they have to vendors. Some vendors may not be comfortable uh, coming and selling. Uh, because uh, they are fearful of maybe getting exposed to the virus. So without a doubt, there are challenges. Uh, but as the former mayor just spoke of, I would encourage all businesses uh, to really push the pencil, look at these programs that uh, the Commerce Agency has, has uh, outlined, and there could be a pocket there for folks. I know there's a lot of private uh, entrepreneurship going on. A lot of foundations are trying to support farmers markets as well um, and they're offering micro grants uh, to some of the farmers markets uh, to help with some of these added expenses to get through this so I, I think there's opportunities we just have to be creative to find them and I would encourage everyone doesn't matter the size of the business to look at all these programs there may be something in there uh, that can support your business going forward thank you very much I do want to remind everyone, uh, this is our proposal uh, to the legislature at this point in time, so none of this has passed yet. We're hopeful uh, that they will look favorably upon this and we'll work together in trying to find solutions. Uh, but at this point in time, this is not passed in some respects. Uh, uh, we've uh, we've done a little bit different here in Vermont. We want to work with the legislature. It's not under the just the control of the governor as it is in other states. So I just want to remind everyone this is just our proposal at this point. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Taylor, Channel 7. Can you hear me? We can. All right, so this question, I'm um, not sure who would be able to answer it best, but I'm wondering um, if you've been talking about or if you know of any of this uh, federal funding would go to the arts of Vermont, um, if money would go back to our theaters and cinemas that have kind of taken a loss during this pandemic? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, all sectors are represented in what we've proposed today. So that would speak to um, the arts, theaters. I can't remember what else you named, but yes, the answer is yes. All right, thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Uh, this might be for Joan Goldstein. It, it saw, Joan, that you had mentioned oh. permitting. This was um, when Governor Shumlin was the recovery from uh, Tropical Storm Irene. It was quite controversial that he put a lot of the uh, permitting aside to get uh, the mitigation done to fix the roads and the, and the, uh, the, the rivers and all that. Is, is that... What, what are you talking about with the, the when you mentioned the permitting issue? Uh, we're not contemplating something of that nature. It's more of a, co a concerted effort 
amongst intra-agency and inter-agency rather to make sure that projects get through their paces in a timely manner. So it's not quite what you have uh, introduced in the beginning of your, of your question. What you might okay. consider, uh, Tim, is some of those projects that were uh, in the midst of their permit process three months ago, uh, and then this came along, uh, COVID-19, and, and that put a halt uh, to the permitting process. We want to jumpstart that to make sure that they don't lose ground so that we can put them into place as quickly as possible. Okay, and as a follow-up, Governor, um, there's a lot of, there's kind of a battle going on as to when, in Maine, when they were gonna open up their borders to out-of-staters and creating kind of an us versus them and the, and some of the industries there. Are, are you concerned that that could happen here in Vermont without, without giving too much hope to the tourism industry? Yeah, no, again, we're watching uh, the, the modeling, uh, the data and so forth. We're hoping that we can open up as quick as possible without um, you know, preventing harm to Vermonters. Uh, but this isn't just uh, Vermont. As you mentioned, it's Maine, it's New Hampshire uh, as well. Uh, even uh, even New York and Rhode Island uh, have all had the same measures. Uh, they're trying to protect themselves, take care of their, uh, their citizens, uh, but at the same time, um, they know uh, that in the future, they want to open this up. So the, the healthier we are as a region, uh, the more we do the right thing, uh, the, the faster we're going to get back to uh, somewhat normal. So I'm, uh, I have great hope. Uh, we've seen a lot of changes. Again, the numbers uh, still are, um, are, you know, in some respects, when you watch the number of positives in Massachusetts or New York uh, and Connecticut and so forth, uh, still growing, um, they've reduced their rate. Um, so uh, there's hope there. Uh, they're going to be opening up their economy. And again, I hope as a region, uh, as in the Northeast, uh, we'll be able to open up uh, as soon as possible. All right, great, thank you. Brittany, Local 22. Hi, um, so just a quick question. Um, when the last economic relief package was passed and everything, I heard from a lot of different businesses that they had trouble and issues um, getting the, the money that was promised to them. So I was just wondering if you have any plans in place um, this go around to make sure that there aren't as many issues and that people are getting that money as soon as possible. Well, I think what you're talking about is uh, on the federal side with the PPPs, uh, and this is just this is our economic package, uh, you, utilizing some of the federal dollars through the CARES Act. Uh, but we'll have a little bit more flexibility in doing that, and hopefully, uh, putting that on the ground just as quick as we can. We'll need again uh, to to remind everyone this is our proposal to the legislature. We'll need their support in doing so. They might have some ideas of their own, might want to make some changes. Uh, but uh, but hopefully they'll expedite this uh, so that we can put it in the hands of uh, Vermonters that need it right now. Um, so that's our goal. Um, we uh, we hope that uh, I think as uh, uh, former Mayor uh, Lozon had said, um, they, we're hoping that the federal uh, delegation in Congress will take action on the second round of the PPP. Uh, so that they are, allow for flexibility so that we can take advantage of that as well. Uh, but that's a that's a federal program uh, through the SBA and so forth. So um, our portion, uh, we uh, we again hope to put this into the hands of Vermonters uh, much quicker uh, than uh, than has been the case with the federal federal package. Thank you, Joe. The Barton Chronicle. Hello, Governor. I think this may be a question for Secretary Tebbets. Uh, the farm economy, the dairy economy especially, has been in really terrible shape given the milk prices over a long time. I'm curious as to how, what kind of percentage of the need uh, that farmers are facing, the available um, assistance will cover. Um, I understand you're doing the best you can, but I'm curious as to how much more will be needed to keep um, what we have left of our dairy economy going. And similarly, how will cheesemakers and other producers 
fair, how, mu how much more will they actually need? Yeah, prob good questions. I'll, I'll let Secretary Tebbets answer that, but I would also add uh, there's a, an initiative on the federal level on uh, direct payments to farmers and so forth, so there will be some aid. And, and this problem, uh, as you noted, uh, this isn't new. It's just become more severe. Uh, so what we're trying to do is make sure that we protect uh, the farm farmers uh, as well as uh, any ag business and any business in Vermont. We want to protect them uh, at, the, at this point in time uh, so that they can survive this, uh, so that they can th thrive in the future. Secretary Tebbets. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, you know, this really is, a, is, is about um, is about survival and on farms there's many days of rewards where you know you you plant something it grows and, and it, you get a good crop or you produce some quality milk or you make some cheese and those are the rewards but right now it's it, it's about survival and challenges and I, I can assure you that the agency and the governor and the team at commerce and everyone at state government is going to fight for the survival of every single farm uh, i don't care if you're milking 50 cows somewhere you're milking 500 somewhere uh, we're going to do what we can uh, to get them the resources from the state level. It's going to take it's going to take help from the feds as well. It's going to take private enterprise. People are going to have to go into their wallets and buy local butter, cheese, and help out. They're going to have to maybe volunteer at their local farm to help them get through. Maybe it's a time that today's the day you bring a casserole over to the farmer to get them through the next day. So that's what we're up against, and that's what farmers are up against. But I can assure you that we're going to fight for every single one of them, no matter size, shape, where they live, that we're going to do the best we can and give them some choices and some options so they can go on to a, to a, a better day. And that, that's our goal. Um, thank you. But given um, the request that you're making of the legislature for assistance, um, what what proportion of the need that farmers are currently experiencing do you think that can cover? Um, you know, how, how, how far will that get them? Because as, as we yeah. both know, um, the situation has been critical for years now, given the extended stint of uh, low prices and, you know, the disappointment of expectations in having a period of hiring. So what, why don't we sort of outline the program just a little bit for you that we're, we're thinking that we'll present to the legislature. Well, and you're on the dairy side, so the people that are milking cows or, or, or goats or sheep. Uh, we're looking at basically four components. You've got small farms, we've got certified small farms, you've got medium farms, you've got large farms. So let's take large farm, for example, uh, a payment um, this is averages, there's much more to come, but an average payment that we may give in a grant to a large farm could be $110,000. But they're projecting losses uh, that could run into, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, um, but that $110,000 is, is valuable because it's going to be able to pay some of the bills that need to be paid to get them to the next, to get to the next step. So that's what we've got to do. We've got to get them from month to month to month to month. And, you know, by fall, who knows? The world may be different. All through this whole entire process, it's week to week, it's day to day. The markets, we hope, because as America opens up again, the world opens up again, people are going to start going to restaurants, coffee shops. They're going to start to buy uh, more of that, uh, what's been lost. So the price to the farmer, which is the federal system, may be improved. So that's what that's how we're, we're, we're looking at, at the program. And we're like talking in a global scale of about 670 dairy farms and about 140 uh, processors uh, across the state. Thank you very much. Joe, Joe this is a, a great reminder uh, for all of us. If we want to preserve our farms, if we want to help those in need, uh, there's never been a time uh, more important than now to buy local. You know, think about what you're doing. Buy local milk if you can. Uh, buy yogurt, uh, cottage cheese, cheese, and so forth. But it also goes extends to other products, and that's what uh, Commissioner Pelham was talking about. We're going to market Vermont in a much different way. 
uh, it was about 10 years ago when I first became lieutenant governor that I had this campaign going where I talked about, um, you know, buy local. It's not just for hippies anymore. And uh, it's never been more important than today. So remember that as we find our, you know, work our way out of this, we can help each other out by just looking at the products we buy and, and just buy from each other. And uh, that will help us survive this. John, VPR. Thank you. Uh, quick question about the mechanics of this package. Um, legislatively, is this one big bill, or are there pieces, uh, you know, such as the ag piece that will go to the ag committee and then, you know, be broken out separately? Yeah. Um, and then, how, how how quickly, ideally, would you like to get this done? Uh, in the state house um, two parts to that uh, we're going to present it as a package uh, it's up to them as to how they deal with it I would imagine they want to send you know break it up into pieces and send it back to the respective committees uh, for their oversight and and so forth um, so but that's up to them uh, how they handle this uh, from my perspective uh, the quicker the better um, ideally it'd be within a week uh, but uh, but I'm not sure that that's uh, going to be um, uh, if, if that's doable or not, uh, but uh, but certainly uh, they're still in session. Uh, they're still taking testimony, uh, so this uh, this could be done uh, fairly quick if uh, if they are of a mind to and they uh, understand again uh, that we're trying to do whatever we can. But knowing uh, they may again have some ideas of their own, uh, might want to uh, manipulate the package a bit. Um, but uh, but for the most part, uh, we think it's a solid package. Uh, and it's something we can put on the ground just as soon as they get they give us the uh, the green light. And the legislature may also weigh into this um, voting by mail question. Uh, I wondered if you and Secretary of State Jim Condos had had uh, reached any agreement. He's pushing for this opt out plan where we get everything in place and then opt out if we don't need it. I think you want the opt in version. Um, any headway there? Yeah, no, that's uh, I, that's not correct. Uh, actually, uh, the last okay. letter I sent uh, to him said, uh, I'm in agreement. Uh, go ahead. Uh, let's put this uh, into action. Uh, I'll agree to your opt-out provision. Um, but I had asked uh, that we form uh, a different committee uh, to oversee that after uh, the primary to see if we opt out. Uh, and I thought uh, it would be great to have uh, either myself or designee, uh, the Secretary of State or designee, uh, the Commissioner of Health, because uh, I think that's important that we look in the future and determine whether we should be doing this or not or, and uh, whether we should be opting out. A, uh, a member of the Mayor's Coalition, as well as uh, a member from the Town Clerk Association who has to administer a lot of this. So, um, and, I, and I'd ask anyone who is uh, running for office not serve on this committee to advise us as to whether we should opt out or not. So. Uh, the good news is uh, we've agreed uh, in principle. Uh, he had wanted to do it in one step, uh, make the decision today. I, as you know, I'd asked uh, that we make the decision after the primary. Uh, I initially said opt in. He said opt out. I agreed. And here we are today. So I, I think the, the good news is we're moving forward uh, to have this plan in place uh, just in case. And that letter just went out from your office? No, that was last week. He had, last uh, week. I think okay. he had directed uh, he had directed me uh, to have a response by Thursday, and uh, we gave it to him Thursday night. Okay, thank you. Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Hello, thanks for taking my question. I have a question about reopening businesses and community organizations. Our local public access television station is curious to know when they can open their doors to the public for people to use the studio and for in-station shoots and for other business. I don't know if we've considered that, Secretary Curley. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, I, without knowing the exact setup, what I could imagine is um, under low or no contact professional services, you could have um, up to, you know, you could have a, uh, up to 10 people actually at this point in the room with, you know, socially distanced and whatnot. So I don't know how you 
you know, get all those folks, you know, to be seen the way you want. So you may have to go smaller than that. But um, at this point, I think there's a, an open door for that to happen. Thank you. I'll share that, pass that along. Thank you. Greg, the County Courier. Hi, Governor. Uh, you'll probably be happy to know that I'm not going to ask you about this uh, economic package that you're uh, proposing. Um, what I'd like to ask you about tonight is uh, Vermont Thunder uh, Motorcycle Group that does a memorial weekend ride uh, every year. They end in Enosburg, uh, start in Sharon. Um, it's my understanding that uh, every year they are escorted by either VTRANS or state law enforcement um, and that that is not going to be uh, done this year. They're still going to do the ride, but the state is not providing any uh, sort of escort. Uh, was that at your discretion or do you have any information on that? I really actually don't have any information on that. I've uh, ex I participated in that ride a, a couple of times myself. Um, so I'm familiar with it. Uh, someone had asked me about this a couple of weeks ago um, about whether they should be planning it or not. And I had advised that uh, there's nothing we can do in terms of having uh, those on motorcycles uh, go up the highway uh, to different points. It's the, uh, it's the gathering before and after uh, that are going to be problematic. So if they could accomplish that without uh, congregating before and after, I see no reason they couldn't have the ride. In terms of uh, the escort, again, I'm not familiar. I don't. I wasn't asked, um, but be happy to look into it. So it's my understanding that uh, they are going to try to keep a, a very small ceremony under 10 down in Sharon, uh, and and not really do a lot in Enosburg. Would you support having uh, VTrans or or some sort of state? Um, escort for this group yeah let me take a look at it uh, and uh, I can get back to you on on Friday or between now and then I just not familiar enough with it uh, to know what the request was um, so obviously uh, we think uh, we need to uh, make sure that we recognize uh, those who have fallen and uh, and I think uh, with Memorial Day coming up it's important to do so uh, we just have to do it in a, in a different way and it sounds as though if they can if they can restrict the amount of people before and after uh, in one gathering, uh, it sounds like that would be accomplished. So I would want to do whatever we can to, to help out. But um, but let me look into it, Greg. Thanks. And just a quick follow up uh, for the Commissioner of Health. Um, it, it was my understanding that you guys were going to put together uh, something for where the numbers were uh, as far as cases that were positioned out of state, I can't find it online. Is that online or was that just submitted to other media that had requested that? Commissioner Health is going to try and answer that. Hi, could you more specifically state that so I know exactly what you're looking for? Uh, so I, I know that uh, other media, particularly Mike Donahue, had asked for uh, the number of cases out of state and the breakdown of, of where those cases are. Um, I can't find that online. I'm wondering if that was provided and if it's being provided online or if it was just provided to the media that had requested it. So you want to know uh, like what percentage of out of staters were from a specific state versus another state? And what percentage yeah, of the, to and what percentage you know, of the total? They represent if there's five from New Hampshire and 25 from New York and 50 from Connecticut yeah. or Massachusetts, yeah. whatever I, that. I do know. I do know we have data, so uh, we'll we'll work on getting it to you specifically. Okay. I, I guess my question is: Is that provided online or just as a per request thing? I don't believe it's required provided online. Thank you. A3 WCAX. So um, my question is likely for the governor. Governor, the administration has proposed an eight percent cut to state government, and they're recommending wide cuts to state government in response to the decline in tax revenue. Do you think that'll be enough? And what's the reasoning behind it? 
Yeah, I think uh, Secretary Young is on uh, the line. Maybe she could answer that. Uh, yes, I'm on the line. Thank you. The recommendation recently made by the Commissioner of Finance was for a first cut uh, quarter FY21 budget, which is the next three months um, starting July 1st through September 30. Uh, that budget has recommended a 2% decrease in expenditures uh, for most agencies and departments down from their um, first quarter expenditures in FY20. So that gives us some room to operate uh, through the summer until the legislature and the administration um, get a better lay of the land with the revenues over the summer, uh, whether we're recovering any of our lost revenues. Uh, and at that time, we'll be able to make a decision whether that 2% decrease in expenditures should be uh, increased, decreased, or, you know, or and extended throughout the um, broader FY21 fiscal year budget. So it's a very unique um, way for the state to do budgeting, but it's necessitated by the uncertainty of, of where we are with the pandemic, the uncertainty of our revenues, and the uncertainties uh, around the fiscal funding. Um, but hopefully this economic package that, that the governor and the team have uh, presented today is going to help jumpstart our economy, restart our economy and, and get the revenues that support the functions of state government um, uh, on the uptick. Thank you. Yeah, there are. And uh, a quick. Yeah, go ahead, Avery. Oh, uh, go, go ahead, Governor. Well, I was just going to say the other uncertainty is what Congress is going to do. I know uh, the House representatives uh, passed uh, their package, which would have uh, included money uh, for uh, the backfill of some of our budgetary holes that we have. Um, but, um, but it doesn't appear that the, the Senate will take that up. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's over. And so we'll know a lot more uh, during this uh, three months, next three months, to determine what needs to be done from there. And just a quick follow-up, do we anticipate these cuts could include layoffs? Secretary Young. That is, you know, definitely we're going to have to work on a budget uh, within the constraints of the revenues um, that we're going to, you know, learn more about in the, in the um, federal funds that may be coming our way. And it's just really too soon to say that there's going to be layoffs, that there's going to be um, any action like that. We we just have to get through this next uh, three to four month period, um, uh, get out of this pandemic emergency situation and, and, and get the lay of the land and figure out what makes sense from a budgetary perspective uh, for the full fiscal year 21 and beyond. Avery, are you asking about in the next three months? Um, sure, yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. I, mean, I take sorry. I take it you weren't, um, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll answer that um, anyhow, just in case you were wondering. Yeah. But I don't believe we have a hiring freeze at this point in time. Um, but uh, but again, we're trying to survive ourselves and uh, get through the next three months, and then determine what happens from there. Okay. Thank you, Courtney. Seven days. Can you hear me? We can. Um, okay, Governor, just a, a quick uh, clarifying question. This $400 million package, will that in your proposal be fully funded by the CARES Act dollars or are there any other funding sources? That will be the, the $400 million out of the CARES Act. Okay, great. And then a, a, just a follow-up, uh, unrelated one. Um, I'm wondering if you have any forecast for uh, guidelines for restaurants um, as far as outdoor, outdoor only dining or seating capacity. We're kind of looking for an update on that. Yeah, there'll be some guidelines uh, submitted this afternoon, uh, posted this afternoon on outdoor dining, and I would expect uh, you'll have uh, we'll have more information on that on Friday. But the the guidelines will be posted this afternoon. Great. Thank you so much. Steve, NEK TV. Um, hello, Governor. Can you hear me? I can. 
Um, regarding broadband, um, I had interviewed a power company executive when they rolled out the smart meters a few years ago, and we were practically promised fiber optic, you know, um, everywhere with the rollout of the smart meters. And seeing how there's, you know, there are two lines, existing lines to everyone's home, uh, one being the power lines and the other being the older phone lines, um, will they be getting the lion's share uh, of broadband because they're already existing? And um, for, for Mr. Tibbetts, um, we've seen massive cuts, uh, I mean massive drops in, um, in both uh, student enrollment and we've seen massive drops in the number of farms, yet we don't seem to have, uh, to have seen any cuts in the Department of Education or uh, AAF and M. And another thing, how, are, how can people buy local with the proliferation of dollar stores that sell mostly, uh, you know, processed foods and frozen foods? Um, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I, I will answer the broadband question. Uh, that was probably a different administration. We, have, we were um, uh, not engaged with the uh, smart meters and so forth. That was, uh, I think, I believe the previous administration. Uh, so we didn't promise anything in that regard, uh, but uh, but we haven't we haven't uh, uh, put forward our package, our broadband package, uh, and uh, we'll learn more. You'll learn more uh, as we uh, as we propose that uh, in the coming uh, weeks and months. Uh, and it, a lot of it depends on the on the federal dollars. Uh, in terms of buying uh, local, I think that uh, Secretary Tebbets can answer this, but. If you want to buy local, you can you can do so. I mean, it's, it may be um, may not be in your Dollar Generals, but uh, they're certainly in your small stores and some of your uh, farmers markets uh, and at the farms themselves. Um, Secretary Tevitz. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, we've made a little bit of progress uh, recently in getting more local products into some of the bigger uh, establishments. I don't think we've, we've made it into the Dollar Generals, but we've made it into some of the bigger retailers. As the pandemic was, was, was underway, um, some products were needed, um, and we have established some relationships that weren't there before between uh, Vermont farmers and those, some of those larger retailers. So that's encouraging. Um, they filled the void for now. We hope those relationships will continue and, and they can rely on, on Vermont Ag. I think one thing that we've discovered through this entire process that, um, you know, we, we, need, we need maybe more small to mid-size operations and more capacity for, for processing that can get to some of our uh, regional, regional hubs through this as opposed to a, a big national system through agriculture. But those conversations are happening, uh, they're encouraging, and right now, uh, if Vermonters can access, um, you know, CSAs, uh, get to your farmer's market, uh, buy direct from a farm, uh, that, that we've seen a robust activity with people going to farms and, and buying uh, produce and products uh, right off the farm or, or hop online and, and buy Vermont products. So there's, there's avenues there. We want to do more, and we'll, we'll keep doing that as, as long as we can. How many how many employees are there at AAF and M? Could you tell me that? And uh, regards to bringing casseroles to farmers, would lasagna be okay? <laughs> uh, lasagna, as long as it's local cheese, it would be good. Um, as far as employees, we have about 130 employees. Uh, as the Secretary of Administration said, and the Governor, we do have a, a freeze on now. So some of those uh, vacancies that we do have, we're not filling right now. And we're reevaluating uh, uh, the budget over the next few months and, and going forward. Great, right. thank you very much. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Ed, Newport Daily Express. Okay, we're going to move to Joel, the Burlington Free Press. Hello, uh, Governor, can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was intrigued by part of the presentation that talked about an opportunity to look beyond the COVID crisis and to stabilize businesses and, and um, 
strengthen them to the extent where they can they can thrive and, and grow after this is over. And I was wondering uh, to what extent is this an opportunity to re-examine some of the dairy industry, the dairy farms that have really been hurting for a while as, as another reporter mentioned, and whether or not um, an infusion of something like 50 million to an economic model that at present is, is vital to the state, uh, but is, is a model of uh, an economic model that is pretty obviously a troubled one. Um, whether or not any of this money is perhaps earmarked for um, portions of the industry that show promise or resiliency that others don't. I mean, you hate to pick winners and losers, but dairy is in trouble. Um, so my question may be for Secretary Tebbets, uh, but I'd be interested in knowing, and I think a lot of Vermonters would too, um, whether or not parts of the dairy industry, uh, this, this may expose more than ever their shortcomings. Yeah, I think we can uh, say that for almost any entity, any sector. Uh, I think you can look at our state college system as an example as well. You know, every crisis mm. uh, spurs innovation, creativity, and a necessity to do things differently. Uh, we learned that during Irene, and we're certainly going to learn that in this crisis as well. So uh, I would say, uh, you know, everything, we should look at this as an opportunity uh, to be better, be stronger and to do things differently in order for us to survive in the future. Secretary Tebbets. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, absolutely, we, we need to have those discussions of, about the future, but we need to get to that point so we can have those conversations. This is about uh, survival right now, and Vermont has shown leadership on some of these conversations over time. The legislature has shown leadership on some of these conversations over time. We, we, we've put together a, a, a proposal that we would like the national system to adopt, and that is you know, controlling the, 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 su the supply and demand. But we're happy to have all those dis discussions down the road. They need to happen. Um, there's a lot of things that are happening uh, behind the scenes with, with dairy now. Some of their co-ops are having those conversations uh, with their members sure. as well. Lots of sacrifice that's happening there as well. Uh, but yes, uh, it is worth saving without a doubt uh, we need we need dairy uh, we need dairy to uh, be successful because it means so much to our communities we can't afford to lose uh, farms from some of our towns we're down to one or two farms and some towns don't have any farms left uh, we need to work to get them to the next level to make them sustainable over time and we can have those conversations if we can get to a point uh, down the road, but happy to have those conversations. All right, thank you very much. Again, as a reminder, I, I believe this pandemic will will teach us, instruct us that we have to learn how to take care of ourselves again. And uh, part of our food system, our you know farming, agriculture is the backbone of Vermont, and something that we need to protect uh, so that we can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Governor, I'm, on a on a lighter note, I hope we don't. You're not suggesting that we can, just as we can't tax our way out of this, we can't eat our way out of it. <laughs> no, 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 but we'll give it a good shot, you know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Andrew, the California record. Uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, can you uh, review a bit um, the, the resources that will be deployed to help especially small business owners or the individual proprietor navigate uh, all these different programs and um, uh, you mentioned there's a great urgency in getting this money into the hands of, of uh, Vermonters and small businesses are these programs going to be a you know get to the front of the line or I mean how how, how best can a small business owner prepare to tap into this and uh, and make sure that um, they, they get the help that, that might be available to them. Yeah, I'm going to either have a, yeah. 
Commissioner Goldstein, yes. maybe answer this. Um, but uh, again, I just want to uh, again remind everyone uh, this has to go through the legislative process first. Um, so sure. uh, it's not instantaneous. Uh, Commissioner Goldstein, can you uh, give us Yeah, some yes. Thank you, Governor. Yes, I could address that. Um, so we do have a bit of a divide and conquer um, uh, atmosphere. So the agricultural uh, producers will be assisted by Agency of Ag. Um, the hospitality and retail, um, we will work with our tax department to get those funds out as quickly as possible. We will have VITA um, do kind of the rest of the sectors as well as the regional revolving loan funds. Now to navigate through all of this, we do have our regional networks of development corporations, small business development centers, as well as additional technical assistance providers that we are going to make available as a result, you know, if the legislature agrees with this proposal, we would be ready to get that level of um, assistance necessary. Uh, it's not just getting the money to them, it's also making sure that they're able to reconfigure and reimagine their business so that they could accommodate uh, new realities that have taken place, uh, post, which we expect post COVID. So for instance, in the kingdom here, you know, uh, uh, people who own, you know, a coffee shop or a bookstore or something like that, they, they may be best served to, to check in with NVDA and the, and the local economic development groups. On, That's absolutely uh, correct. Yeah. yeah. NVDA, okay. NCIC, the uh, SBDC helper up in the NVDA office. Um, you know, there's a pretty expansive technical assistance network already in the state and we want to, um, supplement that and bolster that to react and plan for the future of this crime, and, you know, making and it have they already been brought into the fold on, on some of the scope of, of these proposals I, I, or, or is their phone going to start ringing this afternoon yeah. and they're going to be scratching their heads? <laughs> no, I, you know, um, there's been a, a fair amount of outreach about what we've been thinking because we've been thinking and working on this over the past several weeks. And so they have been brought into the fold and we are gonna be dependent um, to have a kind of divide and conquer uh, and deploy assets where we can so that there is not uh, you know, a, a backlog. Having said that, I, we do expect a significant phone activity. I mean, I think it's, inevitable because of the nature of the need and the urgency of the need. And uh, if, you'll, if you'll afford me one more uh, quick one, um, not to look too far down the road, but it, it, are there uh, some provisions uh, being put in place to make sure that, you know, $400 million is a lot of money to make sure that it gets spent the way it was intended to be spent and uh, to track it um, after it goes out the door? Absolutely, we're going to have to track it. This will be uh, in systems where we, there could be audits. There, there are going to be a number of um, certifications, self-certifications, certifications that this is money being spent where it is most needed and where it is uh, appropriate. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Peter, VPR. Pete Hirschfeld, BPR. Okay, we're gonna move. we're gonna move to Aaron at BT Digger. Hello. Um, I think this is a question for the governor, but maybe um, someone else would like to address it. Um, are you concerned about the latest data that shows that black Vermonters are testing positive for COVID at the highest rate and at a significantly higher rate uh, compared to white Vermonters? And um, how do you think the state should address that disparity? Yeah, um, I am concerned. Uh, actually, uh, we spoke about this uh, uh, two or three days ago. Um, we want to involve our um, racial equity director, uh, Zana Davis. Uh, maybe Secretary Young might be able to give us a little bit of um, insight. I, I believe that um, I believe that the directive went to both you and Susanna. 
but I have not heard back uh, from Susanna at this point. Yes, Governor, um, I believe that the um, collection of that data was at the urging um, of Susanna Davis, our Director of Social Equity, and we really appreciate the Health Department starting to collect that data. Um, and she's taking a look at it, uh, and she's going to be advising us on um, you know, the significance of the data and, uh, because we, we have such a small, um, um, we just have a small slice of um, diversity in the state, let's face it, and what, how significant uh, is that data. But I think it matches the data that they're um, discovering in other states as they uh, look at the impact of the pandemic. I'm not sure if you mentioned there was a directive um, on this point. Um, yeah, it was only to ask uh, Susanna uh, to collect the information yeah. and, and yeah. give us uh, some and advisement yeah. as to what we could do yeah uh, and so yes and she is going to she is advising us on the sample size and its significance and, and existing vulnerabilities and she's pulling together um some material for us on that so we can take a look at uh any recommendations but clearly we need to be collecting um, more race data across the state um we need to be uh, supporting minority-owned businesses in this economic package, and so so we definitely are working on this particular um, aspect of the pandemic and its impact. Okay, thank you. All right, and we're going to go back to Peter Hirschfeld at VPR. there apologies can you hear me now we can all right um secretary tebbets you spoke about the financial duress that many of vermont's dairy firms are under and we know that those difficulties have begun to affect the employment status of a lot of the frontline dairy workers who have not been eligible for state and federal aid programs for workers because they are not u.s citizens is any of the $40 million in aid to farmers that you announced today earmarked for direct payments to immigrant farm workers? Uh, under the plan that, uh, that we have unveiled, this would go to uh, uh, dairy farmers. We have about 670 dairy farmers that are, are licensed through us because of uh, sanitation and so forth, and we check for inspections and so forth, so they're under that, and also the, the cheese makers. So that is, that, is where the, uh, that is where the money is, uh, is aimed at. Um, as the governor has said, we're, we are uh, engaged with the legislature. Um, they'll have uh, uh, suggestions for us, maybe changes, maybe they'll like what we've presented, uh, but over time uh, 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 we'll continue to move the package forward. Governor Scott, do you think that Vermont should be providing direct support to immigrant farm workers, given the fact that they are among a very small portion of the labor force that has not received any sort of assistance thus far? Well, I know uh, they're vital uh, to some of the ag, and particularly uh, dairy in our state. So um, maybe with some of the money that's being put forward, uh, the dairy farmers themselves could provide that relief uh, through um, the initiatives that we're putting forward. Uh, as well, I know that there's a bill in the legislature, but but I haven't uh, looked at it myself. But I know there is one there. Thank you. All right, Guy Page. Governor, given the news, thirty-seven Planned Parenthood affiliates nationwide have improperly received Paycheck Protection Program funding. Have you been told if Vermont's affiliate is among them? And if so, what can you tell us? I have, I have no knowledge uh, of that here in Vermont. Um, maybe, maybe a better question for the SBA. It wasn't, a, we didn't administer uh, that, that funding. I think it was directly through the SBA. Okay. Can you tell us anything more about opening up of uh, churches? How soon and when that'll happen? Yeah. And what'll happen? Again, uh, we had uh, some conversations about it. Um, I, I'm not sure that you know whether we'll address it on uh, on Friday or not, but uh, we may. Uh, so uh, stay tuned, Friday. Okay. Thank you. 
That's it. Thank you again for tuning in, and we'll see you on Friday. Mm -hmm.